live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering AWS Summit 2017. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Welcome back to theCUBE. We thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We've had an amazing day. Jeff Frick, George Gilbert with me, Lisa Martin. I think guys, first impressions or overall impressions of the day, it started with uh, Werner Vogel's very energetic, very passionate keynote. It was almost what can't Amazon do? The amount of services that they're offering, the amount of customer logos validating, presumably, and substantiating all of these services, um, it was really quite eye-opening, yeah. I think, for me. Um, but also, some of the use cases that they've shared were, those that were on main stage, those that were in breakout sessions or here with us, really shows that the culture that they're building or have built over the last 11 years now at AWS is really one of experimentation, failure is okay, let's keep moving, speed, 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 and agility. So, so many, so many great things. I just want to touch on some of the culture, to pivot off the culture, conversation Andy Jassy in his, in his keynote, and I think the culture is so, so important. But one of the things he talked about is they banned PowerPoint. He said because it wasn't interactive, wasted a lot of time, no one was prepared for a deep dive because they just put the slides together, and they went to this thing he called the six-page narrative, which I thought was pretty interesting. And, and everyone reads the narrative at the beginning of the meeting. So, you know, everyone's well, before busy. Before the meeting. Yeah, but yeah. I think at the beginning of the meeting. Oh. So everyone's at a common point, because let's right. face it, everyone's busy, never, no one really preps as much as they should before the meeting, so now they force it with a 20-minute read the narrative. And so everyone is at the same kind of depth of knowledge. I thought that was, that was really powerful. And then to write the press release and the FAQs that was phenomenal. before you write the line yeah. of code. Yes. So what, what are the issues that people are going to raise? And what's the really exciting value that you're delivering to the market that you define yeah. in a press release? Yeah. You know, I think it's great stuff. That was as interesting, I thought, as any of the product I releases. I agree, yeah. Because it was, that it almost told us how they keep the wheel spinning so fast. Right. Exactly. Right. And but how? But that that is really culturally different than I think a lot of the companies that we talk to. Yeah. Who, when you get to a a six dot one dot two yeah. press, is it really that interesting? Right. So that right. was really, really revolutionary, and I think speaks to to your point. How you know? How have they been able to build this dominance this quickly? And and not let their competitors gain on what they project as a six to seven year advantage. Well, like you said though, because they don't look at the competitors, they just keep moving, right? And they, and they, they didn't have the, um, you know, kind of the legacy thing holding them back, you know, Clayton Christensen, Animator's Dilemma, they just kept moving forward. But I thought the other really insightful thing that came out of his fireside chat was the, con the conversation around third party sales when they were still just Amazon. And do they let other people sell on their platform? And, it's, and it, he said, you can't fight gravity. So it goes back, it reminds me of like when Schwab went to $19 trades. Dave Potrick tells the story of online trading. They were giving up these expensive commissions, but he basically said, if I don't kill my old business, somebody else is going to do yeah. it for me. So I better be the one that kills it and at least try to take advantage of that next wave. Really powerful concepts. But there was, there's an analog to the fulfilled by Amazon, which is where the third parties went where they sort of essentially took the eBay model and said, we're going to essentially make our fulfillment platform and commerce platform stronger because we're going to take all those other third parties. And then what they did with Amazon, AWS, was take the whole commerce platform right. and open it up for other people because that made it more powerful for them. And there's, there's still more to come. What, what they didn't really talk about, they, they talked a lot about AI, and mostly at the um, framework and tools levels, uh, where framework levels would be for you know, world-class scientists um, and, and the tools would be for data scientists. But when they, when they talked about the image recognition, the voice recognition, the speech, um, tech-to-speech, things like that, they were saying then they're leveraging the Amazon data and training those models so that mere mortal developers can do that. What he didn't say, um, and when we had their product marketing guy here, what he didn't want to say was there's a whole lot of other areas where Amazon, the commerce company, the retail company, has data that no other cloud has. 
that they can offer, not, not to think about really the machine learning as tools again, but as, as semi-finished semi applications. Right. And I think that's going to be pretty pro profound, a pretty profound differentiator versus other clouds. Right. And just the base, just basic scale, right? The, the, yeah. the slide that Werner showed, not only with all the customers and partners of this, but just the breadth of services and the way they keep adding more based on whatever your special function is. I need high I.O., I need ML, I need really yeah. cheap cold storage, I need whatever. They can apply the scale to all those kind of sub-segments and offer a breadth uh, at scale that, you know, pretty tough to compete against. Absolutely, and they continue to innovate. And in Andy's fireside chat, he was really kind of talking about why and how they're able to do that. Being customer focused, not having to look at the competition is a major advantage. And one of the, the themes I also heard and felt today was, if you think back 11 years ago to their genesis, they were very much focused on the startup community, the developers, really won long ago the hearts and the minds of those developers because they were the ones that would try and innovate and fail and try again. Right. But as, um, as the cloud becomes, and I think Werner's words this morning, the new normal, they've done a very good job of continuing to foster and enable developers within startups and those entrepreneurs who want to start SaaS companies, right. all the way up to the enterprise as we see the, the dynamic in buying software change dramatically, thinking about the Amazon Marketplace is a great example, we are now seeing the C-suite being mandated sometimes by the board, you've got to move more applications into the cloud. Well, how do I do that? Right. So it's developers, it's lines of business, like the marketing folks or the sales folks that shadow IT, say we need to do this, you can't help us move fast enough all the way up to the C-suite and the, and the board, and they've done a great job of expanding the conversation, right. expanding the services to really target multiple audiences and meet a lot of pain points. You know, there was a, a press briefing, pre-brief for the announcement of the marketplace um, expansion yesterday, and what came out really interesting was, you know, you go to the Amazon Marketplace homepage, and there's, there's dozens of categories and, and about, I think it's 3,500 actual products from third parties and 1,200 vendors. And you, know, you can't go to a customer, an enterprise, you can't go to JP Morgan and say, here, you know, go to town. But what's, what IBM does with it's sort of their own um, rich library of stuff is they have their global business services and their industry solutions development groups. They take the piece parts and put solutions together for their customers. But what Amazon is now in a position to do is they have solution architects working either for them who are billing out at maybe two or 300,000 a year um, or um, who are working for VARs who've turned into managed service providers who configure these solutions. And so what looks like a self-service marketplace now can serve you know, a, a bank with 100 billion in assets or a trillion in assets because there's now the IBM equivalent of a system integrator who can put the pieces together and who can run them for you if you don't want. Right, and have the aggregated data of everybody else running those services that, so for best practices and stuff, you're leveraging the whole ecosystem, not a single instance at a single company. And that is so big, right? And that was actually, that was one of the themes of our last guest from Datadog, which is, they can watch so much of what's going on, um, not just a customer's workload, but maybe they're not doing it now, but they will be able to do it in the future where they can look across workloads and identify best practices in configurations right. and things like that. And then you send that back to the customer and they pay for that advice. Right, it's just interesting, you know, the, the, three years ago the conversation was all about security around public cloud, and you know, we're done with we're done with that conversation, especially since most security breaches are people lose their laptops, right? It's an, em an employee or a disgruntled employee. But the thing that's, that, that's interesting to me on this, on this startup and, and rent versus own is again, the answer to every question is in a CUBE interview. Why do you want to do the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing infrastructure? Those guys, Thing Logic, still like 14 people and, and, and a couple of dozen hand, uh, developers that are attacking the IoT space they would never even get an approved vendor status at somebody like Boeing or GE or, they, they would never even get to the procurement issue. But now as part of this marketplace, you know, they can come in either as a partner, part of a solution, an adjunct, part of an SI, 
or as a standalone um, app that you still buy through your approved vendor process with AWS, why would you go anywhere else? Right, that, that was a great point that, that you brought up a number of times today, showing not, not only how Amazon is innovating internally and to enable the startups to the enterprises from a public cloud perspective, but they're also enabling businesses to be born that would never right. have gotten off the ground. And right. to your point, it's very valid about even becoming an approved vendor. For a company the size of, of Thing logic, logics, they would never be right. able to do that. So it's it's really exciting. I think overall, I think we'd all summarize the day as a very positive, very enlightening. Uh, I think for me, I was really excited to hear what was going to be going on for IoT and hybrid. Heard some interesting things there today, so I think that's day dot, dot, dot to be continued. Yeah. I think overall, really strong um, announcements from them. The passion was there. Culturally, I think they, they really reap what they sow, and I think that was reflected in, in the conversations that we were able to have today. One thing I'll ask you about, George, you're a smart guy. Speed of light's too damn so slow. So you think so. The speed of light's <laughs> too damn slow, right? Yeah. We hear it over and over and over again. Yes. And, and still, cloud-based, right? Soft underbelly of cloud, you got to be connected. Do you think that, that the speed of light issues with edge and shifting resources, co-locating storage compute and the data, you see any really big hurdles that are just really scary? Like following on the dot, 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 it's, Computing always follows a pendulum. Centralization, decentralization, no, no side ever goes away. It's just a change in emphasis. And we're going to see some analysis have to move to the edge because for the speed of light, you, you know, your, your car, your smart car, you know, it doesn't have time to say, that looks like an old lady who's actually in the crosswalk. You know, I'm going to go back to the cloud and ask whether I should plow through her or you know the car next to me. You know that that needs a low latency analytic. Right, right. Um, but at the same time, and one of our guests was talking about it. If you're looking at the um, um, the pressure at valves at uh, you know a thousand mile pipeline, you probably don't need to react instantaneously. You send that back to the cloud and it'll look at it over you know, a period of time and say, this one's looking like it's going to leak. Right, anomalies. So different, different scenarios. Okay. And unfortunately, we are going to have to say dot, dot, dot. We could talk <laughs> all day about this. Jeff Frick, thank you so much, George Gilbert. What a fantastic day we've had here at the AWS Summit in San Francisco. We thank you for joining. You can follow uh, all of the replays here on siliconangle.tv. And Jeff, what do we got coming up next week? We're at several events, NAB next week. NAB, Oracle, uh, Modern Customer Experience. Um, and you're doing a red carpet, I guess a green carpet award show A green carpet award well. show at the Computer History Museum next week. So stay tuned, stick around on siliconangle.tv to find out all all the things we're doing, it's going to be a, an exciting spring. Again, thanks for joining, see you next time.